we will now be creating the leg solvers. Before I enter the leg bop, I am going to open the parameters in a new window. This will allow me to access the parameter information more easily. So we will want to access the parameters which are shown in this node. And to do that we will need some understanding of how the multi-palm blocks work. All of the multi-palm blocks will allow you to access parameters in the same way. The only real difference between them is how the interface looks. In the previous video we set the first instance to 0. This will mean that all our arrays will start at 0 instead of 1. This is easier to work with as almost all programming languages are 0 based. This of course includes both Python and VEX. We can then look at the parameters we have created. I will select one of these parameters, in this case the target. The thing to pay attention to here is the name parameter. A hash has been added to the end of the name parameter. This applies to every parameter that is underneath these folders. This hash represents a number. For every version of this parameter we create, we will have a number incremented to the end of this. So this will become target 0, target 1, target 2, etc. And this will allow us to access each of these tabs individually. We will now start working on the solver itself. I will get an inline code node. This node will allow you to use VEX in a VOP network. It also makes it more easy to access the parameters in the interface. I will add a variable. All of the native variables in the inline code node will be preceded with a dollar sign. I will name this variable count. I can then get the value by referring to the channel. This is a channel integer, so the function will be chi. We will start by selecting the folder itself, and the attribute will be set with the folder's name, and that name is legs. We can then see if the node is working and it isn't. In fact, we get an error. The reason is the parameter that we have created, count, actually needs to have an output. Any variable you create in this node needs to have the output explicitly created. I will start with the output one type, and I will set this to be an integer. I will then set the output name to be count. I no longer have any errors, but I will still want to make sure that I am getting the correct value. So I will get a print node, and I will connect it to the count output. I can then select the print node, and activate output text to console. So I have now got my output being printed, and the value is 6, which is correct. So next we will get a for loop. We will be working with the standard for loop. I will then connect the count parameter to the input in on the for loop. I will then get a second inline code node, and we will loop over the index. If I scroll down in the inline code node, we will find the input values. In this case it has set the index parameter to index out. This is set from the name of the output parameter in the for loop. I will rename this parameter to just be index. I can then start adding parameters to the inline code node. The first parameter's name will be targets, and this will be set by a string channel using chs. We will need to have a custom string in this channel, so we will create this using the sprintf function. The first part of the string will be our targets parameter, and I will need to add a zero to the end of this, and that is why I am using the sprintf function. To do this I will add a wildcard. This will start with a percentage sign. And since this is a string, it will be followed by s. The second parameter will then be the index. Note that this parameter needs to be preceded with a dollar sign. I can then set the first output to be a string. The output's name will be targets. And I've made an error here. I have misspelled sprintf, it should have an r in it. I've connected my print node to the second inline code node. And in the printout we should see the lists needed for our leg groups. We will need to create the rest of the parameters, so I will duplicate this parameter. The first parameter will be the root, and I will change the string to root. This will be followed by the goal, and the twist, next will be the stretch, And finally, the squash. I will then add the outputs. Root will be a string. 
The goal will also be a string, as will the twist. We'll then go to the second tab to add our next two parameters. We'll need a float for both the stretch and the squash, so I'll need to change their channels accordingly to CHF. The output for stretch will be a float, as will the output for squash. I can then plug all my parameters into the print node to test them. And I'm getting all my parameters printed out correctly, and it is looping over the parameters correctly. There is one thing which I really want to make sure of here, and that is that the targets will have all of its group names in the correct order for the leg. If the order of these is incorrect, we will have strange results. So I've still got my solver here, and this solver will need to set our point transforms. For this, I'll get a set point transforms node, and I'll plug it into the solver. This will be setting our points and our global transforms. I'll then want to get the points. This will need a get point transforms node. This will be plugged into my targets. Once again, our targets will be set with multiple points, and our root, our twist, and our goal will be set with individual points. So the target output in our inline code node will set the group input in our get point transforms node. I have made another error in my network. I'm setting the wrong node. I should have got a set point transforms node. We'll need to make sure that the transforms are consistent. In this case, my look at axis should be negative z. And my lookup axis is either y or negative y. I'll set it to negative y, although I'm pretty sure that this is wrong. Although setting this to the incorrect value will help show why this is important. The next node will apply to a single point, so we'll get a get point transform. The root will be plugged into the point parameter, and we'll plug the global transform into the root parameter for our solver. And the roots move into the correct position relative to our center of gravity control. However, this is incorrect at the moment. I need to change this node to be set from the second input. When I do this, the roots move into the position of the roots for the controls. I can then duplicate my get point transforms node, and this should be connected to the goal. The global transform for the goals will then set the goals in the solver. The tips of the legs are now positioned at the goal controllers, although the orientation of the legs is not particularly good at the moment. We'll duplicate the get point transform node again. This will be connected to our twist, and its global transform will be connected to the twist in the solver. The legs are now controlled by the solver. There is, of course, a bit of deformation in these joints. They're not in the exact position which they started with the original chains. However, when you get to an IK which is greater than two bones, this is always going to be the case. The final things that we can pass through are the stretch and the squash. This will occasionally give a warning. This appears to be a bug with the IK solver. It will tell us that we're converting a float parameter to an integer. However, we're passing a float parameter into a float parameter. This warning is intermittent and will not always show up and can often be removed by reconnecting the node. So now the solver is finished. We can now go back to work on the controls. I'll get a reparent joints node. I could be doing this all in one reparent joints node but it is easier to keep track of my network when I do it this way. This will also allow me to be sure what the execution order will be when I'm reparenting. I'll rename this node to reparent legs, and I'll add an operation. I'll set the parent to be the center of gravity, and I'll select one of the leg roots. We can then use an asterisk as the wildcard and have a suffix leg root. I can then work on the leg controls themselves. I want the root controls to follow the center of gravity, but I want the leg controls to be global. The twist controls, however, should follow the leg controls. So I'll select one of the leg controls, and this will be the parent, and then I'll select one of the twist controls as the child. So we can now see how this will work. I'll need to set the VOP for my leg solver as the display. I can then select the post node. I can activate it in the viewport and then pose the rig. I'll select my leg effector, and I should now be able to pose the front leg. As you can see, the up vector follows the leg control. 
and all of our legs are responding to the center of gravity control. And our twists are working for all the arcades as well. I now need to make sure that the parenting applies for all the leg controls. In this case, I'm going to use a wildcard to select all of the twist controls and another wildcard to select all of the leg controls. So that's the legs finished. I have added this cross and stretch. That's not something I'm specifically aiming to use with this rig, but we can test that as well. If I place the control at a distance, I can then set the slider and we can see that our leg stretches to meet the goal. That's our leg solver, and in the next video we'll set up an IK-FK blend for this solver.